Good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday and it is time for Coffee at Care. We co-present this series with Arizona Opera and we are so happy that our co-presenter was able to pivot quickly with us to turn this normally in-person series into a live stream event. We have a really great singing technique presentation today coming to you with David Schildkret, the ASU Director of Choral Activities, Mac Wolf, a Marion Roos Poland Arizona Opera Studio artist, and as always, lovely piano. We'll kick things off with a cultural story from our host, Sheree Hertz, and then our guest storytellers will be telling personal stories. Those storytellers today are naturopathic Dr. Kelly Clough and Tanya Chakravarti of Local First Arizona. Our BEAM series is also coming back in March. We'll be now doing that series on the second and final Thursdays of the month. And the first one in March is a big one, Tatiana Crespo. She is the lead singer of a group called Las Choyas Peligrosas, but her solo stuff is fantastic. She's an accordionist, a guitarist. She sings and does her stage banter bilingually. And that was one of our most viewed streams last year. So we're having her back. She's fresh from a trip to Costa Rica, her homeland. She's written a slew of new songs and she's gonna be sharing those with us on March 11th. Big one. Those shows start Tatiana at 7 p.m. Crespo. She We're going to hand it now over to our guest presenters Joyce, today, soul... and we are ready to kick off Coffee at Care, co-presented with Arizona Opera. Enjoy. Good morning. I'm David Childcret, and I'm Director of Choral Activities at Arizona State University, and it's my real privilege to be here this morning for Coffee at Kerr sponsored by Arizona Opera, to talk a little bit about the world, in a sense, behind the scenes. This is one of a series that we hope will give you a sense of how people get ready to do an operatic performance. I'm calling this talk, From Start to Stage, How Does a Singer Prepare? And here to help me this morning, this is a little bit of an unusual format, we have Marion Roos Pullen studio artist, Mac Wolfs, and the director of the Marion Roos Pullen Studio, Chris Kana. So the question before us this morning is, how do people study to become singers? And I thought that might be interesting because of course it's my business. I teach at ASU and I teach students who plan to become opera singers. So how do people do that? And what do they have to learn? How do they do it? And how is learning singing different from other kinds of musical study, playing the oboe or the double bass. So that's kind of what we're going to look at briefly this morning. And I thought it would be sensible to start out with some singing. So Mac has kindly agreed to sing the composer's aria. This is from the end of the prologue of Strauss's opera Ariadne auf Naxos. And it is the composer waxing eloquent on why music is the holiest of all of the arts. Poetry the character says, is pretty good. Poets write pretty good words, but music gathers together everything like the cherubim before the heavenly throne, and that's why it's the holiest of all the arts. So here are Chris and Mac doing the composer's aria.
about that, um, but unfortunately it's just a few of us because COVID, you know. Thanks so much, both of you. So what does it take for Mac to get to the point to be able to do that? And of course, if we were doing this in Symphony Hall as an Arizona opera performance, that sound would have to carry all the way to the last row of the balcony without the aid of any kind of amplification. So that in itself is a kind of remarkable physical feat that I think most people understand, but it's only one dimension of what's going on in preparing a singer. So what we're gonna do this morning is I'm gonna try to set this up a little bit and then Mac and I will talk about each of these aspects so that we can give you a little sense of what goes on behind the scenes. Now, if you are a longtime uh, supporter or uh, viewer of Arizona Opera, you may recognize the name Schildkret because my daughter, Miriam Schildkret, is very active in Arizona Opera as a chorus member and in the education program. And I must say, my proudest title is Miriam Schildkret Dad. Um, but my point here is that when she first told me she wanted to be an opera singer, we had a little talk. I don't often give my kids much advice because <laughs> that's frustrating for everybody. Um, but I did think I had some, some ability to kind of prepare her for what she would need to do. And I said that a singer needs mainly five things. Number one, I think, is a desire and a passion to be a musician because so much of it is discouraging. It's really hard. You can be really wonderful at it and never really get much of a chance to do anything if you don't have all the right kind of luck and so forth. So desire, passion, drive, and perseverance are really important. Next, I would say there has to be a, a, a personality that is, that is suitable to this work. That is somebody who is always prepared, always on time, and easy to work with because you spend lots of hours together in stressful situations and you need to be able to cope with that and be fun to be around. You have to be able to engage an audience. You have to stand up and communicate the enthusiasm of the composer to people many yards away from you and be interesting doing it. And that's in itself not all that easy. You need a measure of health consciousness because the instrument is the body and the body is the instrument. And so you have to be more than typically conscious about what you eat, what you drink, the hours you keep. Singers are notorious for having to say to their friends, sorry, I can't. Uh, yes? <laughs> all the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And of course, they're now jubilant about everybody wearing masks because the thing that makes singers craziest is a sniffle, right? Because of course, that can lay them low. It wouldn't a pianist in most cases. But I think the number one thing that my daughter needed to work on was the skills you need to be a musician. Understanding how music works, the ability to translate printed notes on a page into sound. So it, singers have to be able to do that without the aid of an instrument. We call that sight singing. It takes a lot of practice. And the other thing is knowledge of languages. You sing in German, you sing in French, you sing in Italian, Spanish, maybe Russian, maybe Czech. We've done uh, uh, Dvorak's opera, Rusalka, here. So it, you never know what you're going to get in the way of language. So lots of things to study. And I would say these fall into three broad categories. And we'll deal with each of them in turn this morning. I would say there's an intellectual side. It's all of that stuff that singers need to know, the skills that they need, in order to just do the thing to begin with, never mind to be interesting. Um, the second category might be physical. And here's where we're thinking about vocal technique and just the, the physical ability to render the music. And then the third dimension is emotional. Uh, and that's about the ability to communicate emotionally, but also the ability to withstand the pressures of this business, which are considerable, and which are sometimes more than they need to be, but nevertheless, you, 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 have, to, you have to have survival skills. So we're gonna talk first about this intellectual dimension. What does that involve? Well, now we're talking about, if you will, the coursework that somebody would take in college and graduate school, which is where most of the professionalizing happens in the United States. So college music students study uh, a thing we call music theory, which is more or less the grammar of music. It's, it's how music works. It's how the notes relate to one another. It's understanding how the music is put down on the page. It's understanding structures. And that helps you to have a construct in your mind 
about how it's going, it helps with memory, if nothing else. But it also just helps you to, to, to know what it is that you're doing. So that's the study of the grammar. The study of the literature we call music history. And this really is like studying a language. It's like studying French. First you learn French grammar, and then you read stories in French. So music history, covering the range of music that a singer might sing and how we got there is, is also pretty important. Um, a whole range of musical skills that include not only sight singing, but the ability to match pitch with extraordinary accuracy, to render rhythms with extraordinary accuracy, and the ability to be a musical collaborator, because singers almost never stand and sing without anybody else with them. There's a pianist, at least. There's probably other singers, and certainly an opera. There's an orchestra, there's a conductor, there's all the things. And figuring out how to fit into that is another aspect of the study. So now let's bring Mac into this. I've yacked long <laughs> enough. Um, so out of that range of things, Mac, that for anybody, there's going to be stuff you love and stuff that you maybe didn't like as oh, of much. Course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So what was the thing you most enjoyed about that part of the music study? I loved music history. Like, I loved learning about, like, why things are the way they are and how certain composers, like, influenced other composers. And, like, that was definitely my favorite. I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, in my work as a professor, I observed that people tend to gravitate in one of two directions, and right. I think it has <laughs> to do a little bit with how they view the world. So some people gravitate more to the music history side because they're fascinated by the context. Mm -hmm. and, and they like learning about who the composer was and why the composer chose to set that story to music at that point in their lives and so on. Others really like getting into the nitty gritty of what's on the page, and those folks tend to gravitate toward music theory. Yeah, I think that's a, a very particular type of like brain, like a way, it's, it's kind of like a math brain in a way. Music is so, it's math. And um, music theory and like sight singing is like, it, it's hard for some people, harder for some people. And like, yeah, it definitely took a lot of practice for me to get to a place. But I'm, I'm there now. <laughs> Six know, years of school, we got there. And that's the thing that, that I, I often have to remind students is what you find hard doesn't mean you, you won't ever be able to do it. It just right. means it can take more work. Right. Um, and I'm not sure people told me that uh, enough. What, you know, I tended to stay away from things that I found hard because, you know, why would you do that? <laughs> um, so, what, so what came easiest to you? What was the thing you thought, why is anybody struggling with that? Uh, within the, the things that you just said? Yeah. Um, I guess sight singing, eventually it came easier to me. Just like being able to like, like the pitches and like hearing the pitches and being able to like sing those out. And that, that eventually became easier to me as a singer compared to maybe like uh, an instrumentalist or something. Because I mean, that's my, my instrument. Singers rely m m tremendously on their ear, and indeed, more than some other musicians. Again, they may learn it, but a pianist, sorry, Chris, uh, can get the correct pitch pitches. I think, I think Chris could do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can get the correct pitches by pushing a button. They don't have to be able to hear it. They do to be able to do what Chris just did. Uh, but at the beginning stages, you don't have to. But even from the very beginning of singing, you have to be able to imagine the notes, to be able to sing them, and that's that's hard to get to. Um, I, what was the biggest surprise? What was the thing when you got into class and you went, really? I have to know this? Uh, <laughs> probably theory. <laughs> I, it just was like a foreign language to me a little bit. Um, having like not really come from an opera background, I kind of found it like when I, I found it when I was 17. So it was kind of playing catch up a little bit. Um, so yeah, having to know like the different kinds of chords and like which chords can be right after one another and like using Roman numerals to like label the chords and like writing our own music. I was like, I have to write my own music <laughs> to like learn? I don't know what to write, but <laughs> I, yeah, that was definitely surprising for me. I think that that's also a pretty common experience. Again, from, from my end of having watched students struggle with this, I've been teaching in colleges for 40 years. That's hard to believe, but it's the truth. <laughs> so 
uh, often theory is the thing that people study with, and, and singers often do more than others because of the way they're trained. You just heard Max say, uh, coming to singing opera at age 17, as opposed to a violinist who may have taken up the violin at age three or four. Sure. So already behind the eight ball in some sense, not really, by 13 or 14 years, right? So that's something to, to deal with. And the other thing is that singers often come to the idea of being a professional singer because they've enjoyed singing in a choir in school. Mm -hmm. And we're often guilty, we choir conductors, of just standing up there and banging out the notes until everybody can sing them accurately and not worrying too much about teaching the students about how to do that more for themselves. I will say that's gotten better over my lifetime. But when I was in school, that was what choir was. You, you, bound, you pounded out the notes until everybody could sing them. So I, I didn't know what a chord was. I didn't know what a key signature was. I realize we're talking in code for some people. But these are the ways that music are, is written down and then the ways we deconstruct it in theory. And for a lot of students, that is a hard moment. It's not something they're particularly expecting to study. And as Max said, you mean I have to write my own music? <laughs> What is that? I'm just trying to figure out how to do the stuff that other people wrote. Yeah. We mentioned languages. Mm -hmm. So what languages have you sung in? Uh, I've sung in Italian, French, German, English, Spanish. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to bet Latin in choir. Oh, Latin. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, but you were thinking as an operatic solo. Yeah, singing, yeah. We yeah. don't have many operas with the libretto in Latin. I can't think of one, actually. Me <laughs> maybe we should write it. <laughs> so, maybe not, obviously. There are some people who could speak all of those languages. She listed five or six fluently. But most of us can't. So what do you do to be able to sing in German, for example, uh, unless if you're not fluent in German. I actually don't know which languages you're fluent in. Your English seems pretty good. My English <laughs> is my best by far. <laughs> um, so to prepare to sing in different languages, we take a, I mean, I guess it varies by school, but I took a year of uh, each language, like just to learn to speak it. Um, and then we, learned a thing called diction, which uh, is honestly the best thing ever for a singer. Um, and you use the, you use IPA, which is like the International Phonetic Alphabet. Yes. Not and, India Pale Ale. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not IPA <laughs> beer. Uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's so cool. It's kind of like another language in a sense, but it's an alphabet that translates to like any language. And you have to learn the rules of each language and like what certain, uh, you know, if two letters are by each other, then it's gonna be this sound. And if it's two letters, it's this sound. But you use this one alphabet. So if you can like write that out, you'll be able to like pronounce any language, even if you've never studied it before. Like, I would probably have to learn diction for Russian, but like if I did, without taking a Russian, language course, like I would be able to like pronounce Russian. Maybe Russian's not the right one to take. No, but, but, I, I, <laughs> but that's clear. So just in case you're not familiar with this and only know IPA as a beer, the International Phonetic Alphabet is another alphabet for translating and what it does is it, it reduces ambiguity. So, so for example, the letter J, which you might say in English as J or J, or in French you say J, and in Spanish you say H, huh, right? I'm over exaggerating you would use different IPA symbols to indicate which one of those is relevant. Um, most languages have pretty subtle differences in vowel sounds. So for example, I think of in German, <clears throat> there's at least two ways to say the letter E. Sometimes it's what we call closed, like in the word Ziele, E, and sometimes, well actually that had both E's in it, because the second syllable mm -hmm. has the E, so Ziele, so that's a good example. Uh, and again, they're diff represented by the letter E, but different IPA symbols. And part of what Mac is talking about is learning when you would use the closed E and when you'd use the open E and when there are exceptions and so on. That, so that's how um, singers approach language. They usually also know something about the grammar so that they can do at least a rudimentary translation, sure. uh, maybe word by word. Um, so it, it, the, this engagement with languages is pretty substantial and pretty serious and it, it takes 
a fair amount of study. So I, let's move on then to another dimension, and this is what I'm calling the physical. And the obvious thing here is vocal technique. It's just simply getting your voice to do what Strauss asks of the singer in the composer's aria, mm -hmm. uh, to pick our immediate example. Um, and then it, it, it probably is not a surprise to any of our audience that um, singing is partly athletic. It requires the same kind of discipline and training that being an athlete does. Uh, you have to keep all the muscles active and you have to figure out how to activate them. So there's a dimension to studying singing that's about understanding your body, what it can do, what it's less interested in doing and how to get it to do it when you need to, and uh, uh, how to make that as effective as possible. And by, by this I mean keeping the sound of the voice consistent and even, that's not so easy. Um, as you're changing vowel sounds, all kinds of things change, and you have to keep the sound still beautiful. Make sh making sure that it projects, that it can be heard over an orchestra. If you're doing Ariadne auf Naxos, there's a pretty good sized orchestra in the pit. Not as big as the one for Rosenpavillier, for instance, <laughs> but it's still pretty big and it's busy. Yeah. And that's a challenge. Uh, and then, of course, there's the distance of, of, of just being heard. And so all of that requires study. Um, and that happens in a weekly voice lesson. Most singers, again, in college are taking at least one hour of voice a week. They're probably also in a class that we might call a studio class where they sing for one another and get kind of practice of standing in front of each other, practice critiquing and so forth. Um, and then there's another dimension to vocal study, which is that you may go to a separate teacher who we call a coach, who can help you with stylistic things, help you over the humps of learning something, help point out the things that will help you in the accompaniment and the things that will draw you away from your line or all of a sudden the tenor singing something that will draw you off <laughs> track and you might not have noticed that. But it's also command of styles. And why is that? Because oboe players don't do that. And, and I don't know why I'm picking on oboe players today. But <laughs> anyway, uh, Sorry, if you play player. the oboe, that comes from a factory. And of course, there are differences in oboes. There are better or less good ones. But oboe players play the same repertory. Singers don't all sing the same repertory. A bass doesn't sing the same thing as a soprano. And the bass can still teach the soprano because at some fundamental level, the voices work the same way, but they don't sing the same literature. And even if you, a soprano is teaching a soprano, maybe she's a soprano who sings Aida, and that's not the same kind of voice as her student who probably sings Susanna or Despina. They're just different kinds of soprano voices. So it's unlikely that any voice teacher is going to have the mastery of the particular repertory for every student. And even coaches don't. You might go to one coach for Russian <laughs> opera and a different one for French opera or one for bel canto like Donizetti and another one for more modern music, they, there's even specialties within that. So, Mac, what happens in a typical voice lesson? Uh, I mean, that does vary between uh, teachers, but usually you'll do some sort of like warm up and then you'll go into like technique. Um, voice lessons for me are just like all technique. You might bring a like a piece that you're working on but within that you have to find the technique that you need to use to sing that piece so that could be like well yeah so technique is like getting to know your voice in a way i think every song is like a puzzle in a sense and like every song you're not going to use the same exact sort of technique and every style you're not going to use the same exact technique so um you kind of do like, you do warm ups, like scales you could, or you can do things to access your chest voice versus your head voice. And uh, yeah, it kind of varies. So the, uh, let, let, let's dig down a little further with yeah. that. So, so uh, Mac is using the phrase warm up, which sounds athletic, doesn't it? And to, an L, to, uh, to a certain extent, it is. She yeah. al uh, uh, Mac also mentioned head voice, chest voice. That's a not so technical term for how the muscles function, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And most of us speak in a rather low register. If I were to translate to pitch, it would be probably what about an OF maybe. Uh, this is at the bottom of the staff, but that's not usually where people sing. People sing usually about an octave higher than they speak. Mm -hmm. So 
it's important to activate the muscles that are needed to make those sounds. We don't use them very much. And that's part of what warm up is about. It's also about connecting the different parts of the voice so that you get that even sound. So yes, it's often scales. So, ah, oh, then ah, oh, and you see why I'm a conductor, not a singer. Uh, <laughs> And then maybe arpeggios, da, 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 or different kinds of patterns. It's usually yeah. patterns over and over again, simple, moving up and down the range of the singer. And then maybe there's a technical problem that they're trying to solve, like they want the voice to move quickly. So we're going to do some warm-ups that require what we call agility, where the voice mm -hmm. has to move faster, that kind of thing. Then when you say vocal technique, uh, for maybe somebody who's in the audience, what exactly is that? What do we mean by vocal technique? That's difficult to explain. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just, it's, it's the, I guess you could describe it as like the sensations that you feel when you are singing, because you really don't want to try to listen to yourself when you perform, which is a difficult thing because we are singing very loud <laughs> and we're in our heads, we can't really escape that. But like, it's a sensation thing. And like, it's also a physical thing. Like we use uh, like big yoga balls sometimes to like help our, uh, help our chest voice come in or like get like that lower body connected up to our upper body. Cause singing is a full body experience. And, um, or sometimes we use like, I don't even know what it's called. Like there's like a thing that you can like squeeze between your legs to do something similar like that. Um, yeah, but it's like a sensation that you feel and like you try different uh, ways of singing until you figure out the thing that works for you consistently and that you can like rely on to get you through an entire opera. Because singing that long, like singing for three hours almost straight, like is a feat and you're not singing quietly like you're singing some substantial music so some of this has to do with if, if you think about the voice as an instrument which is a little bit dehumanizing i apologize but it's a it's helpful construct so the musicologist kurt Zachs, to try to classify instruments said that all musical instruments have three basic components there's something that initiates the sound there's something that vibrates, and then there's something that helps the sound to resonate. So in the voice, the thing that initiates the sound is air. So a big aspect of learning vocal technique is how to get sufficient air to do what you want, and how we sometimes call this breath management, how to have enough air flowing. When, when Mac goes for that high B twice <laughs> in the composer's aria, mm -hmm. There has to be enough air to keep everything moving. That's a big part of it. And it's not the way one normally uses air. So that's one aspect. Mm -hmm. Then the thing that's vibrating are the vocal folds. These just two little tiny bits of muscle inside one's throat that are coming together at rapid pace. Uh, and again, we have to keep the air moving for that to happen. And then finally, resonance, which is everything above the vocal folds. And to some extent, even some things below. The body is the resonator. Mm -hmm. But how do you almost direct the sound so that it will bounce off the most resonant parts of your skull, for example. A quick anecdote, uh, one of our voice faculty members at ASU is Gordon Hawkins, wonderful singer, and he's sung with Arizona Opera. Uh, he was in uh, Tosca. He was uh, the, the, the terrible villain. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, Baron Scarpia almost didn't come to me. Um, anyway, yesterday, for the first time in many weeks, I was on campus, and if you can visualize this, I was coming out of the parking lot at Gamage Auditorium, and Gordon was about a block away by the music school. And he said something in a normal voice to the young woman he was walking with, and I heard him and I went, that's Gordon Hawkins. So vocal technique is being able to make your voice go that far in a distinctive way that's immediately recognizable. I heard him before I saw him, and he was far away from me. Now, I couldn't make out the words. It wasn't that good, but it was, it was, that was astonishing. Um, what was something that, so what was a particular challenge that you had to overcome through voice lessons, something you found hard? Um, well, as a mezzo, chest voice is pretty important. Um, and 
it took a, it took me a while to get like a, a grip on it because it also comes with age. Um, as singers, like we can't just like practice more and you know have our voices just grow because we've practiced more. Like sometimes it just takes time. And so uh, yeah, I worked with many. Well, I worked with my voice teacher at the time and many a coaches and. <laughs> many a different pieces to try to access my lower register in like a strong like mezzo way and we got there by the time I turned uh 25 I am 25 yeah about yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 24, 25. and boy know. this is a process and and yeah. Mac is pointing out it's physiological you're working with your body and what you can do at age 30 is different from what you could do at age 20 by chest yeah. voice Mac is referring to the lower pitches the lower, in yeah. the voice, which tend for most of us, if I start singing, oh, and you see it, it, the sound even stopped um, because it got a little bit breathy and it got woofy. Um, I did that, on, I didn't have the sound stop, but I purposely didn't focus my sound. Mm -hmm. When what you learn to do as a singer to develop that chest voice is to keep the higher resonance working. So if you start here, you have a certain resonance, and if you go, Ah, and again, I'm not a very good singer, but I kept the resonance as I went down. And that, of course, I'm a lot older than Mac is. So I, it, my body is done growing and is done getting old now. Um, and that has different effects. So it's learning to manage the, 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 the parts of the machine so that everything works the way you want it to. Right. And it takes thought. Partly because, and I do talk a lot about this, partly because your, your body isn't actually designed for singing. You don't have a voice so that you can sing. That's a bonus. Your larynx is there to keep food from falling into your lungs because somebody's idea to have the same opening for your food and your, and your breath. Um, but it's also there to keep the air pressure in your body. If you do exertion, you'll hear like a tennis player will grunt. That's not for show. They're keeping the air pressure inside their body. The muscles here are for moving your head so that you can see the woolly mammoth coming. Um, and so the part of the problem with singing is that all of these muscles are designed to do things that we don't want them to do when we're singing. Tension is the enemy. Right. And so learning to let go of the tension, learning to feel it coming, learning to know that, oh, this part scares me, so I tense up and I do something with my breath. That's all part of vocal technique, isn't it? Yeah, it's an ongoing process, and new things will come up, and you try a new rep, and then you're like, wait a minute, I thought I already fixed this. <laughs> so mad. So do you still take voice lessons? Yes, yes. How I, often? Uh, not as often now. When I was in college, I, I would take them once a week, sometimes more, when I was preparing for something. Um, now it's usually about like once a month, or twice kind of it's basically you have to be able to like regulate your own technique and your voice and and we've learned that going through school like you you kind of learn how to be the most knowledgeable about your voice that you can and you learn techniques and you learn problem solving for things but then every once in a while especially after you sing a big role like you'll want to go back and check in with like your voice teacher and be like all right, I need you to like kind of press the reset button and like help me line everything back up again and so I can continue singing healthily. <laughs> One of the things that can be frustrating for singers is that you can do things that are not the most efficient even on a, on a spectrum toward unhealthy. By unhealthy, I mean they could lead to injury and injury is a part of this. Mm -hmm. So part of what they're learning in vocal technique is how to do the things they want to do without injuring themselves, so they can do it over and over again. That's, you want reliability in the voice and durability. And if you do it badly, it won't work. So for instance, maybe any of us could go and run a marathon, but if we haven't trained to do it, we're gonna get hurt and we're gonna and take a long time to recover. The bad news is, let's say Max sings the composer's aria and figures out a way to belt out that high B, but it's not the most efficient and helpful way to do it. Mac will then risk getting into bad habits mm -hmm. that then there will be work to undo. And that's actually a lot of what happens in early vocal study, isn't it? Right, yeah. That's, that's like the, when you learn like Carmen when you're in high school, maybe 
it seems like it's like a very recognizable aria and you're like, oh, I want to sing this. Like I want to be an opera singer. But then when you like come back and revisit that like 10 years later when you're actually going to sing the role, it's, it's a lot of like relearning. You have to relearn the technique, relearn the messed up French that you <laughs> learned. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it's, it's, you have to be so careful with your voice because you can't just replace it. <laughs> like, and, and that's, it's ended some people's careers or taken them out for a while and they had to like relearn and go back to the basics to like build their voice back up again in a healthy way so they can continue singing. Yeah, there are many famous examples of that. Julie Andrews was one. Mm-hmm. Um, Adele was another. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in the world of opera, Denise Graves had a wonderful career that basically foundered because of vocal injury. That was more because uh, uh, she thinks it has to do with that she was having some uh, body injury problems and was taking a, a high amount of ibuprofen, which was recommended, but that can affect uh, bleeding. And so she had some bleeding in the vocal folds that, that then was uh, irreparable. So th- this is a very real thing. It's just, again, it's like athletes. It's just like injuries for athletes. Um, you, you probably know the news that Tiger Woods had a terrible accident yesterday. So, you know, we hope he'll be able to come back and, and golf again. But so you can be injured in life itself, but also injured doing what we're doing. So let's come to the third area, which is emotional. Um, and here what we're talking about is how do we convey the composer's enthusiasm for this holy art of music to somebody sitting 60 yards away? Um, Uh, How do we deal with depicting powerful emotions? Let's think, for example, of Violetta on her deathbed. Maybe she wants to be crying, but if you cry, you can't sing. Birgit Nilsson famously said, you make the audience cry, you don't cry. (laughs) Because if you've ever cried, you know you sob, your breath doesn't work, that wouldn't work for singing. So how do we deal with depicting powerful emotions while still maintaining the, the physical ability to sing. And then there's the other side of this that I alluded to briefly, and that is that singing is hard emotionally because, um, first of all, everybody has an opinion about what you do. And you go to a teacher, and the teacher tells you you're doing it wrong, and the coach tells you you're doing it wrong, and then the conductor tells you you're doing it wrong. And you have to learn to take that in a spirit of, they're all trying to help me get better. And honestly, some teachers are better at this than others. Some are better at giving bad news. Some are more <laughs> respectful of the other individual's personhood. Um, but whether the, the person delivering the news is good at it or not, the singer still has to find a way to take it on board. And that takes some emotional energy. And then, of course, there's auditioning and constantly going out there and saying, hire me. And 99% of the time being told politely or maybe not politely, thank you very much, uh, we don't need you. Um, until you find the person who says, yes, you're exactly the one we need. So a lot of rejection and a lot of criticism that most of us don't have to endure. So, Mac, how did you prepare to become what I'm calling an operatic actor? So that's, you've got mastery over your voice, and now you're going to present a character. What kind of training, what kind of classes, what kind of workshops? Yeah. Um, Well, we took acting courses, like, specifically to... Not, not for singing, like just for like straight play acting to get like a grip on that. And that was super helpful because, I mean, while we did explore some like more emotional things, like we had to like figure out how to do that without actually crying when we sing because crying when we sing is not a, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> um, we also uh, work with like coaches Honestly, coaches help with that, with like, uh, like the story and like the translation, and like they know the style and they know like what kind of emotions need to come out and maybe how to achieve that using like a more technical thing. Um, we also did performance classes uh, with opera directors and things like that in uh, in uh, college, and. Um, we would do like scenes and uh, really have to like dive into like, why is this character doing this? What was this character doing before? What is the backstory of this character? 
like learning every single thing about the person that you are to become. And then when you sing the aria, like you already have that whole thing in your head and you can use that to like pull from when you're singing. But yeah, those are the big things that we use for uh, performance or for the emotional side of it. And, and this, so there's kind of a, several different ways to reach this end point. But one of the things I think of is, you know, is I'm actually a big devotee of, of a kind of watered down version of method acting that is that accessing the emotions oneself, I don't like the abusive side of that, but, yeah. but you know, accessing things that have happened to you that might be similar to what that character is feeling and help you understand kind of how you respond to a situation like that. But you know, we all love to watch cartoons. I've watched them since I was a little kid and a drawing of Bugs Bunny doesn't feel anything. Somebody has to figure out what is going to happen with Bugs Bunny's eyes when Bugs Bunny is smiling. Um, we've all, we were joking about this before, we've all had to learn to cultivate the eye smile <laughs> so that you, you know, we can tell what's going on even though we can't see the mouth. So there is a way that you can communicate emotion by knowing, well, if I fiddle with my hair, that's going to look like I'm nervous. Right. It, you know, if I keep my head down, that's going to read one way. If I keep my head up and my body open, that's going to read another way. And really to be somewhat conscious and calculating of that, right? It's just really to pay attention to that. Yeah, and the fact that you're performing for an audience that could be like 50 feet away from you or 30 feet away from you and then all the way to the back of the theater, like they're not necessarily going to be able to see every little thing that your face does. It's very different from like uh, camera acting, which is something that we're all having to learn how to do now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so we use our bodies in a more grand way to portray emotions or our voices like getting like that like emotional sound in our voice without compromising technique but yeah being able to play to like a theater of like 4,000 like all the way back <clears throat> is that's what we're preparing for and to have all those 4,000 people feel like you were doing it just for them Right. And I, it, so that's, that it's intimate. I, I always think of Beverly Sills, yeah. uh, who was a, a, a big star when I was coming up. And you want to talk about acting with the voice. Listen to any recording by Beverly Sills. You, can, you don't have to see her to know when she's smiling, when she's mm -hmm. not smiling. It's amazing. And there, I don't think there was ever a singer who looked happier to be doing what they were doing than Beverly Sills. It yeah. always looked like she wouldn't be anywhere else doing anything else than singing for you right at that moment. Look her up on YouTube, you'll love it. Are you up for singing the composer's aria again? Do you think you got one more in you this morning? Yeah, I think I can. All right, Bring so. some more of my tea. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, as Max prepares to do that, maybe you can think a little bit now based on what we've done about <clears throat> what might be going on here. Mac, of course, wants you to pay attention to the composer's absolute enthusiasm for making music. The, uh, the composer views this as a kind of priesthood <coughs> and he's going into a sort of trance, isn't he? Yes, he's having a come to Jesus moment. Yeah, you go. <laughs> so it, just a couple of very quick questions. Uh, what do you have to do each time to be ready to sing this piece? Um, I have to warm up and make sure I have like access to my <laughs> Full voice. Um, no, you can keep the mask off. It's okay. I want okay. you. Okay. She needs to be able. To, Mac needs to be able to breathe. And um, even like a physical warm up too. Like I'll I'll stretch and like make sure I'm like fully in my body. And yeah, take a deep breath because this is a a short but like wild ride of an aria. And so just to remind you, this is the composer saying, yeah, poetry's fine, but there's bunches of stuff you can't put down in words, and that's what music is for. Music is a holy art. So this is, again, the composer's aria, and once again, we have Chris.
the, the, the very last thing is die heilige Musik, which is actually a little hard to translate. Uh, when you try to translate it, it sounds like something out of Batman. Holy music! <laughs> right. <laughs> so my translation says music the holy, uh, because if we said sacred music, that wouldn't be quite it either, right? That would mean music for church. Yeah, you could say like y music the sacred thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, 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 it's challenging. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so um, we have time for a couple of questions, and I see there are some up there. I've been, I've been neglecting that. I apologize. Uh, so uh, one of our audience is asking, what kind of music do you listen to for fun? Um, I am a big pop music fan. <laughs> I don't really listen to opera for fun very often, just because like it is like work. <laughs> in a sense, but I listen to pop, uh, maybe some like hip hop, rap, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I suspect most of the audience would be pretty shocked if they came into our homes. And in my home, you would probably not hear music playing. Yeah, silence is nice. Too. Yeah, and because we are, because the way, at least for me as a conductor, if I have to develop my critical ear and that does not turn off easily. Um, and so there's a part of my brain that's always kind of analyzing what's going on, whether it's the performance or how the piece is put together. And so, um, yeah, the, the other part of, of uh, Mayan's question was, you know, what do you do when you're so aware of technique and live every day as a singer or teacher? The fact is you can't turn that off. You can't, it's, especially when you, I'm, I'm finding myself because I'm learning some new music right now. Um, it's constantly playing in my head, like as I go about my day, and and it's a way of my brain making sense of it, and it's a it's something that I have to do. But I'm like constantly humming it or figuring out like weird color tour passages or like things that I just have to like live with. And so yeah, there's constantly some sort of like opera music playing in my head. I always know that I'm ready to conduct a performance when my first conscious thought of the day, something I attend to, I'm always interested in what, because I think it tells me what my biggest priority is. But if my first conscious thought of the day is a snippet of music from the thing I'm conducting, then I know I've really got it in my body. Right. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, become you, one You wake you. up <laughs> singing a chorus from Elijah or something. Like <laughs> <Right>. that, <yeah. laughs> um, so I, I'm actually gonna ask you a slightly different question from the next one that's here. If you could go back in time, let's say 10 years, what would you say to 15-year-old Mac? What would you want Mac to know so that Mac could be ready to do this? I would tell 15-year-old Mac to find your group of people that you totally trust and listen to them. <laughs> You're gonna get like so much information from people throughout your life because everyone wants to help and everyone has ideas but not everything's gonna work for you, and that's okay. And yeah, get your, your group of people that you trust and actually trust them and listen to them and take their advice and bounce ideas off of them and you'll be okay. <laughs> uh, the real question was, who would you like to meet from the past? Who would I like to meet? I mean, gosh. I would like to like party with Mozart, probably. Yeah, that would be cool, <laughs> wouldn't it? You know, just like a night or two, I feel like he knows how to throw down. <laughs> and I'd also ask him to write some stuff for me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I actually have a list. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it w my vision of heaven is that you would get to go around and ask Bach, so how many people were in the choir? And, and right. But, but the, the, here's the problem with that. If that were heaven for me, it would be hell for them because of course they would be being asked those questions right. over and over again for eternity. It wouldn't be so much fun. Um, but I, mean, I know for me, there are lingering questions that we will never really know the answers to. We'll get close, mm -hmm. but we want to know the answers and it would be just so terrific to not have those questions anymore, but we, you know, so it'd be nice to be able to do that. Uh, someone has asked, who would be your dream vocal coach or instructor? Hmm. <laughs> that one's tough. There's a lot. 
But maybe there's a better way or, 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 or an easier way to ask it. Mm -hmm. uh, what singers of your type do you most admire? Who do you listen to as kind of models? I, <laughs> I love Tachila Bartoli. <laughs> I think that she's incredible. I mean, we're not necessarily the same exact kind of voice, but like, I love how she performs. You, some people think it's a lot, but she's known for her crazy faces, but I love that. And Marilyn Horn. I, okay, maybe I would, I don't, I don't know if Marilyn Horn, Horn was a vocal coach, but <laughs> I would like to learn from her. Wonderful <laughs> technical singer. Yeah. I mean, you, you always know, it, it, she really did achieve a kind of epitome of, of, of vocal technique that was mm -hmm. absolutely dependable, especially in the yes. bottom part, right? Yeah, that's why it, she had such a wonderful career. Yeah, buzz she, going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You have to learn to do this, <laughs> get right. it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it, uh, for me it would be Leonard Bernstein if he weren't crazy. <laughs> he was pretty if he crazy. crazy. Yeah, but he was, if he was at Leonard Bernstein on a good day, would be somebody I'd really Some like. Musicians to. are a little crazy. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, uh, so, well, Mac, thank you so very much for doing this. This was a little bit unusual. I kind of roped a bunch of other people into my idea, and they were all very enthusiastic. And I hope I'll remember to thank everybody that I should thank. But we need to thank the Care Cultural Center for their wonderful work and making all of this possible. I want to thank Cassie Robel, the head of uh, education for Arizona Opera, for inviting me, but also for just the imagination she brings to this work. And of course, thanks to Mac and Chris for performing, and thanks to all of you for watching and participating. I hope that you learned something new this morning. So thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much to our guests. This has been Coffee at Care, broadcasting live from the beautiful historic ASU Care. David, Mac, Christopher, everyone at Arizona Opera, we are so grateful to you for helping us create this really interesting programming that's going behind the curtain to talk about singing technique and a little bit more of the life and work of an artist and an educator like David. And thank you so much to our audience for those really, really good questions, jogging some nice discussion there. Our next coffee event with Arizona Opera will be Wednesday, March 24th at 10.30 a.m. Tune in just as you have today. We do recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel so you'll get a notification if you leave it enabled when we go live and you'll never miss a program. We are doing these monthly for the next couple months and we're so appreciative of Arizona Opera for everything they're doing to help create this content. Please also follow them on social media. They are doing some amazing streaming programming just as ASU Care is. So please support both organizations with your time and your comments and your great questions. We really love to hear from you. And don't forget tonight at 6.30, we will have our Gather Storytelling event. That is a monthly event that takes place on the final Wednesday of every month, 6.30 p.m. Tonight's theme, The Secret's Out. Three storytellers will circle up to tell a story around that theme, and then we'll do a really cool Q&A featuring your questions from the audience and some pre-planned questions so they can have a nice discussion. Again, our guest tonight, Sheree Hertz, will be telling a cultural story and guest hosting, and then naturopathic Dr. Kelly Clough and Tanya Chakravarti of Local First Arizona. She's a real foodie with a lot of experience in the industry and a really great story today. So please tune in for that. We'll see you on the next live stream, Coffee at Care, and have a great, safe, and healthy rest of your week. Thanks so much.